Please rise for the procession and remain standing until they are seated. Good evening, uh, colleagues and friends. A uh, warm welcome, Sunny Bonani. So once more, good evening, uh, and a warm welcome to the University of Johannesburg for, for those of us who are uh, not from the university, a special uh, and a warm welcome to colleagues and friends of uh, Professor Wang. And so allow me to first of all recognize uh, Professor Marwala, our Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Internationalization. Where is uh, Professor Marwala? Ah, okay. Uh, also next to him is our Deputy Vice Chancellor of Finance and he is also responsible for commercialization amongst others. And I also extend a warm welcome to Professor Daniel Van Lul, who is our Executive Dean in the Faculty of Management. A uh, warm uh, welcome and acknowledgement of Professor Sinha, the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment. Of course, Professor Wang. Um, uh, Professor Becky Twala, who will be responding to the inaugural address this evening. Senior leaders of the University of Johannesburg, members of Senate and other academics. Allow me to extend a very warm welcome to our colleagues and friends and peers from WITS, from the Civil Aviation Authority, from City Power Johannesburg, from the Gauteng Government's Planning Division, uh, from the Department of Science and Technology, Denel Aviation, and the French South African Schneider Electric Education Center. Uh, just to acknowledge that uh, two colleagues had to, uh, having arrived and greeted us all, uh, had to pack their bags and head off um, to catch their flight at 9 o'clock to New York. Uh, and these were uh, Lieutenant Colonel Professor Barry Shoup, who is the 2016 IEEE President and CEO. It was really wonderful to host him and his colleague, uh, Captain John Chamberlain, who, like uh, Professor Shoup, are from the U.S. Military Academy in West Point in the U.S., of course. So a warm welcome then to colleagues and friends uh, who have found time to join us this evening on this auspicious occasion. Um, allow me, of course, to to acknowledge that this is indeed a great honor and a special privilege um, uh, to welcome you to the professorial inaugural lecture of Professor Wang. Um, as we will learn shortly, uh, Professor Wang has been a full professor since 2004 at the National University of Singapore. Uh, however, it is our tradition here at the University of Johannesburg uh, to invite uh, professors such as Professor Wang uh, to make use of the opportunity uh, that we avail them um, to uh, utilize the professorial inaugural lecture to share uh, with us their latest thinking, their latest work, their latest ideas as a way of introducing them formally into the community of the University of Johannesburg. Uh, and so that is simply our tradition here at UJ and we think it's, it's a very important tradition that uh, we have established. So uh, just to uh, again confirm then, uh, as we will learn, Professor Wang has been a full professor at the National University of Singapore, of course a, a good partner institution, good, good friend of the University of Johannesburg, that is since 2004. And so um, having said that, I believe that this is a proud and a joyful, the landmark moment for all of us, for Professor Wang, uh, and of course, for higher education in South Africa and beyond our borders. Inaugurations, many a times pompous and decadent, we are told. Um, but I guess I should add, hopefully, mostly dignified, well-meaning, and unsullied. Date back, we are told, in the modern era to ancient Greece as the opportunity for the formal investiture of a person into high office and it marks the formal assumption of office or position of authority. Although, as we know, Professor Wang has been 
with us now um, for, for many a month. Um, and of course, we will also learn later when he is introduced by the executive dean uh, that just recently um, Professor Wang uh, uh, took the leap of faith, uh, put himself up for review by his peers um, uh, in uh, uh, peers put together by the National Research Foundation. And uh, just last week, uh, he got the news that actually it was a worthy uh, exercise and uh, the result of which he um, has been rated as an A researcher, uh, which of course is the highest uh, rating uh, available um, in, in South Africa. And so, of course, we congratulate you also on that. Now, the professor, professorial inauguration particularly the one where it is a colleague's first inauguration into the esteemed community um, of the most senior um, academics uh, in their profession, uh, in their institution and across the world, is as important to the incumbent and their loved ones and colleagues as it is to the university. Um, I say this um, since the inaugural lecture is as much a reflection on the state, the intent, the ambitions, um, the accomplishments of Professor Wang, it is equally so a reflection on the state of the university. Certainly, yes, a reflection on the state of the University of Johannesburg, but even more so a reflection on the state of his field of knowledge um, uh, and, of course, the state of peer institutions across our nation, across our continent, and across the world. I say this, of course, because we all know that the, the office of professor is a global, global standard. It holds up, or it must stand up to global standards. And so when Professor Wang stands up here this evening, um, it will be an opportunity for us to reflect, yes, on Professor Wang and his extraordinary accomplishments, but also through him to reflect on what is the state of the university in South Africa and beyond our borders. And so it's a very uh, special occasion um, for us. It is um, an occasion to celebrate. It's also an occasion for critical reflection as much as it is an occasion to reflect on the advances that human society have made, is making, or has failed to make and must remedy um, uh, in, in time. Again, on these auspicious occasions, as I do this evening, I remark on and remind us um, of the hopefulness and, dare I add, the controversy um, of statements such as those of Vart and Gregorian, that universities are, and I quote, not only past rep repositories of past human endeavor, they are instruments of civilization, he holds. And perhaps there lies the controversy. What is civilization? He continues, they provide tools for learning, for understanding, and for progress. They are the wellspring of action. And perhaps this is where I yeah, am in concurrence. They are a source of self-renewal, of intellectual growth, and of hope. They are a medium of progress, and they are add retrogression, of autonomy, of empowerment, of independence, and of self-determination. And yet at the same time, I, I offer us the remarks of Wernick, who argues that, and I quote, the university has a contradictory relationship with its surrounding community. On the one side, the autonomy, in terms of its actual values of truth, wisdom, science, and so on. And I dare add here uh, that you might have observed or been part of the interesting conversations following the lecture at our peer institution, WITS, uh, just last week, or was it earlier this week, of uh, Ungugi Wationgo, um, and the subsequent conversations. One such conversation holds um, that academic freedom and institutional autonomy has regrettably, it has been argued, become the means for stasis. It has been used, it, it is argued, it's not my argument, it has been used 
as an obstacle to enabling our universities here in South Africa to transition from the colonial apartheid institutions that they were fully to the decolonized pan-African institutions. And so Wernick continues then on the one side, the autonomy in terms of its axial values of truth, of science, of wisdom, and so on. And on the other side, he continues, those who control, control the, the means of material production control the means of mental production. And the dominant ideas are the ideas of those who dominate. But of course, these are topics for uh, lengthy consideration, reflection at separate occasions. I am also reminded that very few books are available in decent bookstores. And God forbid there are so few of these now. Um, and we have to search online now for books. Very few books available in decent bookstores on what it is to be a professor. And in particular, what the freedoms and duties of this most senior scholar of the university is. And I dare add, I suspect, that um, it's probably good for, for our professors and academics that there are few such books that hold out the canons or the ideas of what it is to be a professor because we, we prefer to be autonomous. Um, we prefer to, to do things as they go. Alternatively, we prefer to, to have a mentor as our reference, um, so to speak. And in this regard, um, a colleague of us here at UJ, who is a distinguished visiting professor here at UJ, uh, Professor Bruce McFarlane, um, in his book, Intellectual Leadership in Higher Education, Renewing the Role of the University Professor, seeks to correct this oversight and argues, in my view, convincingly, that given the corporatization of the research agenda, professors must reclaim professorial leadership. And therefore, professors occupy a very special role in our universities. Specifically, McFarlane argues that two freedoms, that of critic and of advocate, are essential and must be protected, must be advocated themselves. These are essential for professors to execute their four duties. That of mentor, it's the primary duty of a professor, is the argument. Secondly, that of guardian of standards. I, I personally take a more activist approach. So not just guardian of standards, but activist for standards uh, that are continuously reviewed and elevated. Thirdly, uh, role that of enabler of networking and mobilizer of resources for others. And fourthly, the ambassador for the institution or for the discipline. So this evening we will have only one small insight into how Professor Wang responds to this call for the return of professorial leadership. Let me now invite the Executive Dean, uh, Professor Sina, to introduce Professor Wang. I thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, folks. As the Vice Chancellor was introducing the role of the professor in its four dimensions, I was uh, thinking whether the biography that I'm going to read is going to match this. And I must say that a distinguished professor does, in fact, distinguishedly match these four dimensions, as I will read in, my, in the biography. So indeed, a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Wong, uh, Professor uh, Chinggao Wong, who was born in Suzhou in China. He received, respectively, the Bachelor's of Engineering in Chemical Engineering in 1982, the Master's in 1984, the Doctorate in 1987, both in Industrial Automation, all from Zhejiang University in the People's Republic of China. From 1987 to 1989, uh, he was a, a PRC, People's Republic of China, a postdoctoral fellow with the Department of Mechanical Engineering Institute for Fluid uh, Power Transmission and Control, which is the national key laboratory in China. In 1989, he joined the Department of Chemical Engineering, the Research Institute for Process Control, also a national key laboratory in China, as an associate professor. He received the Young Scientist Award of the Chinese Association of Science and Technology in 1990, and he was named 
as an outstanding China conferred PhD by the State Education Committee in 91. He, he held the Alexander von Humboldt Research Fellowship from Germany and pursued this over 1991 to 1992. There was a component of his biography that was then in German, and I still have to practice this language, so I'll stick to the English. Uh, from 92, but you can read it in the biography, in the detailed biography. From 92 to, 90, to 2015, he was with the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the Univers National University of Singapore, where he became a full professor from 2004. He is currently a distinguished professor with the Institute for Intelligent Systems uh, and the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment the at our university, of course. And for those of you that are not familiar with the model of these institutes, Institute of Intelligent System is an institute that was a catalytic initiative enabling the university's quest for global excellence and stature. His research interests have been in modeling, estimation, prediction, control, optimization, and automation for a wide range of systems, including, but not limited to, various industrial and environmental processes, new energy devices, facilities, defense systems, medical engineering, and financial matters. He has published over 400 technical papers with 260 in international journals and 13 in Chinese journals. He received 12,000 citations with H index of 62 and an I-10 index of 64. He was presented with the award of the most cited, artic uh, art uh, most cited articles uh, for the Journal of Automatica between the periods 2006 and 2010, and he was the Thomson Reuters uh, list of highly cited researchers in 2013. Uh, I must say, when you say highly cited, you don't realize that he, in fact, was one of two, uh, one, uh, number one out of 250 worldwide. He received the prize of the most influential paper of the 30 years of the Journal of Control Theory and Applications. He authored or co-authored six books. These books are listed here, but you will notice that they are number in the domain of automation and control. He is an internationally renowned researcher in the areas of system modeling and, and identification relay feedback systems, auto-tuning of control systems, decoupling control, PID control, and a number of areas relating to control, such as multivariable and robust control. His publications, exceptional publications and citation figures, are a clear proof of such, uh, such achievements and statements. In addition to his world-class academic research, he has practical development experience and successful technology transfer to industries. He worked the majority of his time in a paper mill, uh, at least in, in the, when he was working for the paper mill, it was, for the majority of time, it was in an environment that directly worked in the industry. Uh, and at that time, it was for three years. However, there's a number of masters and doctoral work that continued uh, in uh, relationship to industry at that time in the paper machine uh, arena. He then participated and promoted its implementation of the, of the works um, and also in, over the periods 85 to 90 before he left China for Germany. And among others, there was a major pat patent that uh, originated and also a spin-off company. And the, list, the link of the spin-off company is indicated which dominated the market in China. As you can imagine, uh, reading this uh, biography, this is a summary of a summary of a summary. After he came to Singapore in uh, 1992, he developed practical control systems for classrooms, furnace crystallization, oil refinery, and power systems. He has collaborated with major control giants such as Siemens for dynamic load dispatch, Yokogawa for multivariable decoupling control, uh, Fisher uh, Rossman Emerson for PID controller aut in, and auto tuning, Honeywell for multivariable control, Aspen Technology for model predictive control, DuPont for real time optimal control, and Supercon Technology for robust process identification. He co holds five uh, patents in the US and Singapore, two of which have been licensed, back in, in, two of which have been licensed to, to the US. 
Uh, he has abilities to bring research and practical applications together. And he's therefore a rare researcher that brings theory and applications together. He has taught courses in the teaching and now in the teaching and learning sphere in engineering mathematics, electrical engineering, electronic circuits, signals and systems, computer control, linear systems, servo systems and multivariable control. There it is for, all, for a number of my colleagues that often say, is it possible to have these teaching loads when you can do the research? Uh, he supervised several undergraduate projects on hands-on development work and associated business feasibility studies. He has supervised 30 postdoctoral research fellows, about 30 doctorate students, and 30 master's students. Uh, does that take a number to 90? We've got to work on the 100. Uh, he got teaching awards almost every year. He was recognized as a passionate and effective teacher for his professional services. He is currently the Deputy Editor-in-Chief of the ISA Transactions in the U.S. He was an Associate Editor of the Journal of, of Process Control and IFAC Journal. And I also recognize Professor Craig here, former IFAC President John. Uh, and he is currently on editor, editorial boards of a few other journals. He was the Chairman of the IEEE Control Chapter, Singapore, uh, for a, a couple of different periods. Chair of the Steering Committee of the Asian Control Professor Association, he was the general chair and program chair of the fourth Asian Control Conference in Singapore, the general chair of the fourth International Conference on Control and Automation in Canada, and the general chair of the 10th International Conference on Control and Automation. There were a number of others. I have just listed three. Uh, significantly, and most of, uh, mo as most of you are aware, and as our vice chancellor and principal has mentioned, he received the prestigious NRFA rating just last week. And we are indeed quite privileged uh, to hear from Professor Wong. So in case you thought you're only going to listen to me, Professor Wong is the guest, uh, is the main uh, lead here. Come, come along. Thanks very much. Very good evening, everyone. Welcome to my talk. First of all, I would like to thank VC for welcome address and thank for Professor Sina for introduction and ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guest colleague and today I'm going to give you a talk the talk title is about fourth industry level revolutions and first question you may have on my talk is why I choose this topic and it's also first question which I have when I'm told to give this address the fourth industrial revolution has captured worldwide attention. For example, the fourth industrial revolution is the theme of last year's World Economic Forum held in Switzerland. And you know that the fourth industrial in the revolution has arrived with no historical precedent. And it's changed everything. It's changed the way where the products are made, it changed the way in which the services are provided, it changed the way in, in which that the business run, and it also changed the way people live. And this industrial revolution is actually involved rapidly, and as you can see that um, they changed everything, and they are impact us in every aspect. The why so impact this is because that the fundamentally the building block behind this industrial revolution is the internet. And internet connect million people together. Internet also connect million of people with million of machines seamlessly. And that's why the people have this access to many, many informations. And that's why people built a new technology which help people to have new function, new products and service. For good sight, and we have new technology which give us new products, new service, improving our life. And we are enjoying this life. On the other hand, okay, and we are also facing some challenges and risks. And based on one estimate in US, and it says that about 
50% of U.S. jobs are at risk. I would like to give some example to show you that this new industrial revolution offers both real opportunity and real challenge and risk. And first example is for financial industry. Okay, I'm from Singapore. You know that okay, financial industry is very important for many countries like USA and UK and Singapore. And financial engineering become the top choice of top students of top universities. And for my work in in US, okay, I always have final year project on financial studies. And my project is always hottest in department. And because the students like to work in financial industry, and though I'm working in electrical engineering department, but students like to take my financial study project. And after graduation, they're not working as engineer. They work in banking sector. And because that industry offers them high salary and more exciting life, and that is the case in Singapore. And financial industry is very big and wide. I cannot cover. So I will pick up one exciting element of this financial industry, which is financial trading. And in long time ago, okay, when you want to buy stock, what do you do? You call broker, and broker check with you what you want, and then discuss a bit, and then he will place order. Once order is ex executed, he will inform you, okay, order is in place. That is long time practice. And with internet, everything changed. Now you see a lot of e-brokers. And the e-broker, what do you do? You can use handphone to do the trading. You do not need physical broker anymore. And this is about trading platform. Okay, they already changed and you can do so. But we move one level up. How do you do the trading? How do you choose the instrument? And how do you trade at what time and so on? That is for trading method. And in the past, and people may use technical analysis to do the trading. Okay, you have moving average and so on. Okay, pick up some trading parameters and then you can place order and get trading done. And that is old <coughs> tradition. And you know that okay, in Wall Street and investment banking, what people do? They are called quants. They are doing algorithm trading. And this is more powerful. And to enable this aggregate trading, and people need to program and put program into trading system. And that's why there's a lot of the platform which offer programming language. And most popular one now is Make Trader. It's called MT4. And most e broker offer this facility. And with, with MT4, people can program your algorithm. And this program is similar to C languages. And then, once you program in this language, and you can put this into your e broker and run it in real time. So you can go away, you have lunch, you have movies, everything. So, program will do the trading for you, day and night, without you. That is what happens here. And now, okay, the investment banking guys are doing the algorithm, tra uh, algorithm trading with the MT4 and a similar language. So these guys can earn high salary, and they have very powerful computing facility and algorithm to make profit. Oh, those guys are respected. What I want to tell you is that there is a new change. And those guys are also at risk of losing their job. So recently I found this website. So this website generate the MT4 codes automatically without programming. So those guys who are doing programming can be replaced by such platform. How it works? So you can log onto this website and you will see that is on a few click to give you code for your exam trading. First, you just choosing your 
entry condition by ticking some technical indicator and also choose some parameters. And system can also give you optimization of parameters. And with this one, then you move down and you can choose the stop and target conditions. Do similar thing. After that, okay, you just click generate. The code is done. And then bring this into your e-block system and you line it and you wash away. So system will do the trading for you. So that's why. So you, you see that the programming can be automated. So programming in MT4 or C language job can be replaced by such systems. So this is very powerful. Now my question is what will be next after this one? Can you imagine what next one will perform even better, which you welcome and you like it? Many of you are engineers uh, and scientists. And do you use MATLAB? Yes, MATLAB. MATLAB is more advanced language. You program with MATLAB much, much easier than C language, of course. So we are familiar with MATLAB. So I myself developed a new system which make interfacing between MATLAB and MT4. And together with existing interfacing between MT4 and eBroker, I'm able to trade with MATLAB without using anything else. So I run my MATLAB program with all fancy high technologies. I run it, I sleep, I go away. <laughs> That's it. This is not in market. I do it myself. So with this one, so MT4 programming is not needed. And we move one level up. What? That is things. <laughs> what will be next to next? Even higher, I can build up a further interfacing where people just click a few requirements on trading. They so actually exit and stop. And my platform generates the MATLAB code for you. So you no longer need to program in MATLAB. Because so the MATLAB program is very advanced. It looks like a formula, but still you have a lot of tools which you may not be familiar with. And you may stuck with MATLAB program, but my high level interface will ease your job of program. So that's why okay, there is further, further moving up. So that is the trading technology and trading method. Okay. So let's look at this case with some analysis. Who wins? The end user wins because through the interfacing and the platform enable you to trade with ease and with power. So end user will like it. The number one. Who wins? Who else also wins? The service provider. Because the, if you offer this service to customer, customer will like to use your service. So you gain commission fees. Then who loses? Those, the programmers, in terms of MATLAB, in terms of MT4, they may lose their jobs. So the lesson we learn from this case is that okay, you need to keep the trade with your skill advance. So you move one, high, one level high and one level high. So you are always doing top level jobs and lower level of job may be replaced. By the way, okay, I have a company, IBM. It's a startup company in Singapore. IBM stands for Intelligent Business Management. We develop such a system. We say to e-blockers, oh, that is not in market yet, huh? 
So we have these new systems. So this example to show you that, OK, the new technology can benefit a lot of people, can create new business, but also give risk to certain people, which can be replaced by machine or the systems. Second example. Second example is that, OK, say, suppose uh, you are not in financial engineering domain. I don't bother about this trend. And you are doing MBA, and after graduation, you work in bank and in company, you are doing the market survey and so on. What you do is that, okay, you, for certain market survey, you design questionnaire, send questionnaire to the customer, collect data, feed data to your computer, and run application software. You can generate data and show the graph and analysis and statistics, and then send to your boss. That is what they do. Seems very good. And you are required because you need a market survey. But this can be automated easily. And suppose you set up a website, you click the questionnaire on the website. And this data feed into your server, and server enable the application software and generate graphs, statistics, and automatically send this to boss. So you don't need to do anything. And this is real, it's possible. Everything is possible. And then third example is that, okay, most of us are professors. Okay, we are doing teaching for students. Uh, our job may be also at risk because now there's a lot of online course and modules. I'm supposed I'm teaching electrical engineering. And there are thousands of professors in this world teaching same module. I suppose there's a good professor at Stanford University. He teach based in the world recognized by students. Students just take this online course from him. So all other professors don't need to teach anymore. <laughs> and why do you work there? You may be replaced. And this is not joking. And in Singapore, we join a consortium and with a lot of top university. We try to recognize each other's course, something like that. So this can happen. That's why, OK, all this industrial revolution, technology, and service, on one hand, benefit you. On the other hand, put you into the risk. And that's why okay, we need to be aware of that. Okay. So that's why, OK, this, the fourth industry revolution is important to you, to everyone. And then the, another question you may have is that, OK, so oh, this is important. Then what I'm going to tell you in this talk, the goal of my talk is to try to make my talk the informative. And I will show you essential information on this fourth industrial revolution if you have not read up a lot. And secondly, I try to make my talk to be very useful. And if I, off, I share with you my project and thinking. If you liked, and then we can work together and build collaboration and make contribution. We ride on this fourth industrial revolution and advance our society and our economy and advance our people's life. And in order to achieve this goal, I design and structure my talk as follows. So first is introduction, which I have done just now. And my body of talk consists of two parts. First part will be introduction to this fourth industrial revolution. And second part will show my work on industrial revolution. And finally, I draw some concluding remarks. So now come to first part. So in this part, I try to explore different aspects, but interrelated aspects of the fourth industrial revolution. And then we have better understanding of this one, and then we can act accordingly to our interest. And what is this in revolution? Okay, for human being, uh, you always want to know where comes us. Same question can be asked for this industrial revolution. And where comes this revolution? 
So we need to go back to see other revolution, early revolutions. For first revolution, it used the steam powers. So you have mechanical force to replace the human labor with muscle force. And that's why you can have the, the production increasing, uh, you can have higher production rate. And second revolution use electricity. Uh, most typical example is electrical motor. And then you see the mass production line okay, with powered by these motors. Mm, that is second revolution. Third one using electronics and computer IT technologies, which we explained already. Right? So everyone got a computer in office, and then in factory and so we also use computer to automate the production. And fourth one is what we are experiencing. And it uses the internet and artificial intelligence and try to make the, your production smart or make intelligent productions. And that is the fourth one. I will tell you a little bit more detail as follows. So what does this industrial revolution look like in terms of products, in terms of the service, in terms of life? I have also already show you examples which are more on service side and high level side. So I'm now going to very simple example on daily life and the products and the productions. Suppose, okay, the industrial revolution is in full spin, and so you got everything in intelligent manners. So you get up at 7 o'clock, and then when you're approaching your shower, and heat water is already dropping, and then after that, you're approaching your kitchen for breakfast, breakfast served. And when you're approaching your garage for car, car is started. And then you move to office and the computer is on. And when you come back, the dinner is served, something like that. So I don't know whether this is good or not. OK, but it is possible, right? All is possible. And then why you can have such kind of life? And because you are equipped with the new products, intelligent products. So second layer is products, OK? And we have intelligent products. and. Very simple example is cell phone. Now, many people cannot live with, without cell phone. Although you may have headache with hand phone, and suppose that, okay, battery run low, and then you cannot use it. Now, okay, for the fourth industrial revolution, okay, we have the cell maker who can monitor your system real time. So he knows, and your battery is low, and he can alert you, and you need to charge, and charge is wireless. And suppose you have another headache where the, your cell phone maybe die, and some part got faulty. And then and if your telephone does not work, you feel is, you cannot live. And this can be solved because, once again, the cell phone maker can monitor your system, and he can have prediction of your problem. He can alert in, your, in advance. And before this cell phone die, he can tell you, okay, certain parts need to be replaced. And they ship it to you, and then you make the replacement, and you keep the cell phone working without 40. That, of course, is good for you. And third layer is that, okay, how are these products made in factory? And now, okay, with industrial revolution and high technology, those factory become smart. And they know what you want and they can send you in time. Okay, those are already in, say, the Amazon and the Alibaba, okay, you can order on the internet and then they can deliver to you after production. Those are already in market. And what is missing? I'm proposing. How do you get this one? What do you want and what is not in market? That is the next thing which can come out. And once again, what do you want? for your products, what is not in market yet. So I'm taking the clothing industry as an example to show maybe that is the next stage of the production and service integrated. 
Let's look at the current status of the e closing industry. So of course, there's a lot of uh, closing shops, and there's a variety of clothes for you to choose. But my question is, are you happy with them? Not necessarily. First thing is that, OK, the design is still limited. And second thing is the size is limited. It may not fit you. And design may not be the, the one you like. And thirdly is that, OK, if you use internet to buy the clothes, you don't know whether it's good when you wear it. And that's why you look at internet shopping, the clothes, the sales is quite bad on internet selling. Not like others. As a good, you can sell very well on internet. So that is the current status of the clothing industry. What I'm proposing is called e-clothing. <laughs> what do you want? You want to have fully personalized clothes to match your taste size perfectly. First, in my proposed systems, and we have fully personalized design. It means, OK, you log onto our website. OK, you can choose any design, standard design. You, key, you can change parameter, color, little bit, and so on. And you can also bring your picture. Say you take it today. You put it into your design. And you can modify. The software enables you to do so. So you can come up with your own design, which is unique. Nobody else has it. And then that's first thing. Second stage is that, OK, our system can measure your body shape. So our clothes will fit your body perfectly. And then no matter how good it is, if you do not try it, you don't know whether it's good for you. So next stage is key technology. It's called e-fitting. So we run software. Software is 3D animation. So you will see your design trace is on your body different angles, and you see how it feels. <laughs> and this is a hot research topic, actually. So after that, you feel comfortable. Then you go on to the production. Otherwise, you stop there. You change your design and try it again until you are satisfied with your design and size. So after that, OK, your order goes to factory to make. But remember, for our case, it's fully personalized. And your production line will make only one copy for each item, and not duplications. So your product line should be very, very flexible to change your sizing and the color and patterns. And such system does not exist yet. So we try to come up with such systems. I think for simple things, a t-shirt is possible to develop such system now. And China got some shop and factory doing so. Very simple way. And US also got very few. The company tried to do that way. But we get this fully integrated. That's the thing. After that, of course, it can deliver to your home easily with fast delivery. OK, that's easy. So and OK, yeah. So I'm doing this one with Chinese Academy of Science. OK, we are really doing this work. It's not futurist. It's not the illusion. And we are trying to do this one. It may be coming to market soon. And once you have this company, if this company dominates the market, how big it is, it can be number one company in the world. Because this is all-in-one company. It takes everything. You don't need Alibaba, Amazon. You need a clothes shop. You don't need a clothes factories. And this one. Make everything. So that's why, OK, so I'm running out of time. OK. So, OK. There you are, short talk. Okay, so, why we have this uh, fourth industrial revolution? OK. A major force behind this one is technology change. And technology drives the economy, economy drives the societies. And for technology, it's always keep advancing. And because you, we have millions of engineers doing R&D, they try to improve products and service every day. And they can come up with alternative solutions. That's why you come up with many, many new systems and technologies and services and products. That's why we are changing technology. And in certain states, you jump into another stage. That's a new revolution.
Then what is the characteristic of this industrial revolution? Okay. The main issue, as I mentioned, is internet. And for internet, you want to get data. That's why the downstream, you have sensor and data collection. And through the internet, you send data into your server. In the server, you do processing. And then all application comes, like the one which I mentioned before. Then how to make such a system? Based on the how system works, okay, you can design system. Say you need to have the expertise in sensor communication, you need to have expertise on the internet, you need to have expertise on data processing, and then you have the control guy, the design guy, and so on. On top of that, to design all applications. So key is So key technology inside this revolution is intelligence and automation. So we are working on this one. And that's why this artificial intelligence is very hot in the world now. Then what's the problem, OK, with this industrial revolution? Certainly, on one hand, we benefit. But on the other hand, there is some danger and risk to our jobs. Job may be replaced by machine and computer. That's one. Secondly, is that okay? Because people are connected together, million people connect together by internet. That's why you may losing your person uh, privacy, and your security of the data may be at risk. And also, maybe you are using same technology. You are using same kind of information people become more homogeneous, and there you are lacking of diversity, something like that. And thirdly is that, OK, and because now is bigger growing bigger, and bigger can dominate the market, so it may be dangerous to have only one company. And then you have to pay them highly. That is another issue, which we are facing now. And no matter whether we like it or do not like it, it's, yeah, it's there, it's along the corner. Only thing we need to consider is how we can act and take advantage of this revolution for our benefit, on our interest. For this issue, and personal level action may be too small. So, firstly, and we need national level coordination. So we need some the, um, committee in national level to consider this industrial revolution. They can set up the incentive to advance okay, yeah, this technology and benefit people. Give you an example. So Germany is pioneer in this Fourth Industrial Revolution. Actually, the name Fourth Industrial Revolution comes from Industry Four, which is proposed by Germany. So they are playing leading roles. And secondly, China. China, of course, you know that. Okay, they have called the World World Factory. Okay, the Germany leading high level, high end manufacturing sectors. China is leading on middle and lower level manufacturing. But recently, the wage salary in China is tripled over the last 10 years. That's why the cost of manufacturing increased tremendously, tremendously. And that's why many manufacturing industries are moving out of China to neighboring countries, say Vietnam, and uh, Thailand, and Bangladesh, and so on. That's why China faced challenge to upgrading their industry. And that's why they see this, the fourth industry revolution as a challenge, and they want to take up. And they have a lot of incentive to do so. It's Central government, government is doing so. And next one is the U.S. Okay, U.S. of course, provides, um, President Trump, the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the complaint that they lost a million of the jobs to China, maybe not let's say China, to the low cost manufacturing countries. And they also lose maybe 10,000 factories and so on. That of course is true. But the U.S. try to make up because now the new revolution play important role based on the brain, the intelligence, not depends on labor cost. So they have a chance to catch up 
building very, very advanced factory without much workers, and they can make a product and sell it to everywhere at low cost. That's possible. So that's why they are thinking and doing. So there's a few plans here. Mm -hmm. That's the US. Okay, Japan was a bit slow. But recently, they catch up. They also set up the, this incentive plan. So, and these are four big countries in manufacturing sectors. Who is after them? Maybe UK. But UK have worries. They have big worries. They have done a survey from the industry leader, and they say that, OK, you can lead. UK is in great danger of being left behind in these fourth industrial revolution. And that's why they are worried. They have big worries. How about South Africa? Of course, South Africa is in worse position than UK. Right, OK. You do not have high tech sector very much, right? You don't have very good high tech companies. And uh, the high level, the R&D manpower are not as strong as other countries. Like that. And especially, okay, based on my reading, I realize that okay, you are facing deep deindustrialization instead of other countries who are doing industrialization. And you have shrinkage of manufacturing sector. And because of this one, you are losing jobs. And this drags down your GDPs. That is very serious problems which we are facing here. So, in terms of this situation, South Africa government have to take timely action and quick action to catch up, build up their R&D capacity, advance external technology, and build the manufacturing industry again. And then they can drive economic growth and help people get more jobs, advance their life qualities. So that is about national level. They have to take action. But for us, at the institution level, can we do something? On the other hand, South Africa is not too bad to me. Firstly, OK, you have a good legal system, which is similar to US and UK. You speak English, and English is welcome for businessmen. And also, you have two huge advantages. You have huge natural resource and you have a huge manpower resource. And your, your population is young. And your education is building up. And more people receive these high educations. So you have hope. And for us in universities, OK, because the first industrial revolution is about uh, intelligence and automations. So we have Institute for Intelligent Systems. And we have professors working on this one. And the other university, this university, and the University of Pretoria, they also have very strong teams. So we can work together and make contribution. And make our South African be hub of this industrial revolution, at least for some aspects, to survive our industry, survive our people, not be left behind. So in short, OK, the fourth industrial revolution is along us. OK, we have to take action timely and effectively. Now, your question may be how we do that. That lead, to, lead me to the second part of my talk. So I will show you what I, have with, uh, uh, what I have done for this industrial revolution. So I have done something. You can do this so and you maybe do better than me. So that comes to the second part. <laughs> so I will show you my work related to this industrial revolution. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm running out of time. OK, so I start with example. I hope I have a long time. Okay. Because I do not time in that one, okay. So this is the first time I gave you talk, okay. I have report there, okay. And then I will start with a major project. And this project results in my 
generalization of my project idea to form a theory. And that theory generates new application. And then I have further extension of this theory to cover more wide applications. So this is a project which I want to share with you. Okay, in Singapore we also have NIF, National Research Foundation. Okay, and they have one program for energy. Within this one, we have power generation core. I happen to get one grant. Okay, the title is Integrated Solution for Optimal Generation Efficiency through dynamic load dispatch, economic dispatch. So I'm PR. I got all money, which is more than two million dollars. And then we have partners. One partner is Power Automation, which is joint venture between Siemens and local company Power and Singapore Power. And another company is this, the Power Salaya. And this is a major player in Singapore Power industry. They have market share of 25%. So we are doing this work not for academic research. We do the field test and real-time implementation in the power generation plant. This is real work. And the uh, background of this work is that, okay, and Singapore have used or adopted the liberalized energy market. It's not the, the central control systems. In liberalized or free market, the, if you want to sell electricity, you need to set bidding to exchange. And if you want to use electricity, you need to send your ask to the exchange, exchange to the matching. And then this creates a problem for generation companies because you don't know how much you can sell at what price. That's why they have this bidding strategy problem. And there's a lot of research on this one. Okay? And cut this short is that, okay, there is many research with assumptions. Those assumptions, mean assumptions do not match reality. And, and most research are carried out simulation. That's for the, the marketing side. On the other side, okay, we produce electricity, power generation. And if we are given this load for production line to produce or generation to produce, this problem is called load dispatch. And we have top researcher here, President, Professor Xia Xiaohua. And when we do the literature survey, we saw a lot of paper from him. So we built system based on that kind of results. And, and there is gap between research and applica applications. First of all, okay, usually the marketing part is separate from the production side. They do separately. And second side, second gap is that okay, the research results are not used in industry. There's gap between research and applications. Mm -hmm. Mainly is that okay, those kind of research results are having some assumption which may not match reality, and those results are done with simulation, not the real-time implementations. And that's why we come up with this idea. We call it integrated solution. In general, we try to build an uh, integrated system. It means that we want to integrate marketing part with production part. They work together. And, and we work on the real-life data, collect data, do the modeling, and do the prediction for the demand. And on the other hand, we look at our generation plant, and we do the modeling and do the prediction. And then on top of that one, we do the real-time optimization to do the best match between demand and supply. That's ideal. And we do this one in the optimization framework. And it got this formulation, optimization. So this, uh, we try to maximize an uh, object function where the R is revenue. And usually, generation plant generate electricity as well as heat. That's why you have two components for your revenue. And the second term is cost, the total cost. And when we do this optimization, we have certain constraints. And this is the constraint which we must meet because uh, usually power plant got pre-ordered supplies, and you need to meet it. And then there is operation constraint. Some operation region are not stable, so we need to avoid this operation region. And then we are have the constraint on the power plant dynamics. Okay, and then we have this the demand dynamics. And how we do is that 
we have mainly three modules, demand modeling. We are using dynamic modeling. Mm -hmm. And based on data mining technique, and we modified to suit the have a situation. And secondly, uh, we do the power plant modeling, this is dynamic modeling. And usually GE have a model, which is statics. And we based on the first principle, chemical principle, heat exchange, and energy balance, mass balance. We build the first principle model. And then we can predict the production. And thirdly, we have a nonlinear, the mixed integer problem for our problem. And we solve this problem and with our new algorithm. Then, OK, so this is a new technology and solution. And then where comes profit? Industry is very practical. OK, you work with a company. They ask you, can you make me money? If you do not make me money, yeah, go. Don't come here. So where comes money? Be the is that, OK, and think of buy the new systems, OK? Say then 10 years ago, they buy these G generators. It's good. Efficiency is high. But after year of year of running, the system deteriorate. Efficiency is not there. The equipment is older. The fields are different. And also, the technology keep in change. So their technology 10 years ago is good, but now it's no longer good. They are not upgrading their technology. And that's why we build latest technology for them to improve their efficiency. We generate profit for them. Mm -hmm. I think, OK, time, sorry. OK, I, I think, OK, I'm running out of time, OK. Actually, I'm in maybe more than half, OK. So I try to conclude as quick as possible. So as academician, and we are professor, we are supposed to do research, we want to create new knowledge. We are evaluated in terms of that contribution, right? So the work I share with you is just practical work. Industry can benefit, but what is academic value? What is new knowledge? So I do abstraction from this development, and I come up with this new framework. I call it total predictive control. And this is built not from thin air, based on previous technologies and control them. Most relevant one is model predictive control. Okay? And someone familiar, of course, the professor here, two control professor. And this MPC use output prediction. And for our case, we add two kinds of modeling and prediction. And we do the demand modeling. Actually, in control framework, it is reference. Usually, reference feed in. You know the current case. In our case, we build model for reference. We predict future reference. And you see this information in our control design. That is something new. And also, we build a model and prediction for disturbance. That is also something new. That's why, OK, we are doing prediction for three kinds of variables, output, disturbance, and reference. That's why I call total prediction control. The framework, general framework, is shown in this block diagram. Okay. So this is a production, a production process. Okay. So you can have access for real-time data. And then on our system, we have modeling block for process. And based on this model and new real-time input, we can generate the production prediction. On the other hand, there's a market. You collect data, you build a model, and then you predict the future demand. And both the predict future demand and predict future production can come to your, the optimizer. optimizer. And we generate the best production command, sending to the production line to produce these goods and serve to market. That's our general framework. And so once again, so we want to assess our contribution in terms of novelty. Okay, when you propose some project for funding, people evaluate in terms of novelty. When you submit paper to journal publication, you are evaluated based on novelty. Right? So what's novelty? And as I said, okay, in the past, usually people doing control at process or plant level. 
total plant is bigger thing already. And the department, market department is separate. Usually it's another people, another team is doing that. One. So I'm integrating these two. And also I have a top the layer of optimizer sitting there. That is something new. And in terms of each module, okay, and we are doing the modeling prediction for determinant and the reference. On the other hand, existing technology, MPC using the modeling prediction for output only, and there's another control with preview control which assume exact information for future, which is not realistic. And we do not assume it. We do the modeling on unknown futures. That is something new. And for modeling part of the disturbance and so on, we do not have any applied information. We use latest technology in data mining to do this modeling. And that is what we think is new. Okay, caution, okay, of course, when you use this one, I think you can improve your performance, but there is some secret, okay, because your modeling prediction cannot be perfect. You have error. Error fit into a system, generate some the misbehaviors. So we need to have collection of the control based on the error later. And there's a lot of application which I shall cut down, okay. So there is application to the so the, the, the both the car maker and we can apply this technology to restaurant and hospital and so on. As long as you have supply demand problem and we can do the best match. That's why it's very general. It can apply to many, many applications. Actually, I have extension. So these predictions of time, I have extension for prediction over the space. And that is mining application. And I have extension, further extension for prediction over both time and space. That is application in transportation because car moving over space over time. So we need a prediction for bus over space and time. And that is the center we try to propose, initiated by our dean. So I shall cut short because I run out of time, sorry. Yes. Um, so I summarize my talk Number one, we are already in this fourth industrial revolution. And number two, and we must take action to survive ourselves. Number three is that we can make contribution to this new revolution. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone. Thanks VC, thanks DVCs. Uh Thanks, Deans. Uh, thanks, uh, our guest. I mean, congratulations to, I call him QG. I hope he doesn't mind uh, for, for such a, a good sort of like presentation. I'll just summarize uh, stuff that he has been talking about because he, he sort of like missed the fun that we're having in developing all these algorithms. Um, AI has been around for a while now. Artificial intelligence I'll just refer to as AI. The good thing about uh, these algorithms, I mean, we we can even now predict uh, who's likely to win the British uh, sort of like uh, premiership this year. Uh, I know that Arsenal has sort of like been placed on the fifth. <laughs> Arsenal has been placed on the fifth, but trust me, it, uh, I didn't consider yesterday's results. <laughs> yeah, but uh, th those are, that's the fun that we're having. I mean, we can do that. We can even uh, sort of like teach machines to, to swear, not literally, but... Um, uh, in terms of like uh, developing an algorithm that can manage to sort of like uh, extract toxic like comments. Let's say you swear and you can develop an algorithm that can pick that up uh, using sort of like uh, machine learning. Also, uh, I always like referring to the diabetes sort of like a problem whereby we can even develop algorithms for detecting sort of like diabetes using the retinal, uh, retinal or from the, from the eye. So that's one of the things that uh, AI has been sort of like successful in. But the problem now is here. We tend to forget as to how do we build the systems. We rely heavily on uh, data. Everyone is talking about big data. Time and again, everyone is talking about big data, data science. Some are confusing big data and data science. Some are saying, no, I mean, these things are not going to be working. Africa has been left behind. It's not going to be sort of like successful. The key thing is that UJ uh, have sort of like made strides in that. They realized that uh, for us to be able to apply this big data analytics, let's set up an institute that will be able 
to solve that, this problem that the country is currently faced with. A good one here is, that, uh, is the smart city concept. The smart city concept, uh, it's great. I mean, everyone is talking about it, but we always forget the fact that where is the funding going to come from? It's a very expensive exercise. If you need uh, a, a smart city, I'm sure all these municipalities will be fighting for funding in order for it to sort of like become a smart city. But on the other hand, how do we sort of like improve the lives of South Africans? It's disturbing to see, uh, I like giving examples like the Sasa thing, whereby you see people queuing. Why not develop a, a sort of like an intelligent financial system for the rural areas? so that uh, we cut uh, this problem of people going every time to use what is called CPS sort of like uh, strategy. So to me, that's, that's the thing that we should be considering from time to time to be able to crack this problem. So QG has sort of like given us sort of like an idea about this uh, kind of problem. But there are challenges, obviously. And one of them, which is we always forget to talk about, is the, the quality of the data that we use. To build the systems, you need good quality data. Poor data quality, your systems are going to are not going to be good as well. So for me, it's important that we, we get the expertise as UJ. I always call uh, the institute to get the dream team, guys who can work on the data, guys who can like, develop the systems, even guys that can come up developing the software so that it becomes sort of like a product that people can use in the end. So I'm glad that you guys came, and uh, it's a pity that time is short, but you are free to come to the institute uh, if you can, and we can discuss all these problems that we, we currently face with. So, but thanks once again, uh, QG, and um, we hope to be doing great things together and with the other team members of my institute as well, who I think most of them are here, and my students as well, yeah. But thanks very much. The kind of pressing message is that we have to press on. Uh, we're reminded of the gap um, between where we are as Africans and where we need to be. Um, and I think we were all listening with, with great interest. I was uh, peering around the room from time to time, uh, uh, checking if we are engaged in the conversation. And uh, I think uh, Professor uh, Wang has, has done exceptionally well uh, this evening. Um, so I, I hope that uh, all of us will have then uh, concluded that the University of Johannesburg, on behalf of our collective of universities globally, have made the right decision to offer uh, this uh, gentleman uh, the position of professor, and not just professor, but of distinguished professor uh, here at the University of Johannesburg. Thank you. And uh, I'm certain that we all agree with that. Uh, is that uh, right? Yes. <laughs> I, I take that as a democratic vote to, <laughs> to confirm that the university uh, made the right decision and uh, in, as Africans we would say that uh, Professor Wang made the right decision mm -hmm. to join uh, this university and of course to join uh, our Africa estate of universities. To, to elevate um, our continent um, and, of course, the nation states that make up the continent. So uh, I think on, on, on behalf of everyone here this evening and everyone who's not here, um, from Senate and so on, uh, I just want to extend uh, congratulations uh, uh, this evening and also sincere appreciation for sharing with us uh, these wonderful insights in this uh, very animated and engaged manner. Uh, that you have this evening. And uh, again, we want to wish you only the very best in the weeks and the months and the years that lie ahead um, in this journey uh, that you are undertaking uh, with us here at the University of Johannesburg in Africa. So again, congratulations. <laughs> so, uh, hopefully in the future I will not have to go to China to get this... Uh, this item of clothing. <laughs> so I want to invite the uh, executive team, Mr. Tuala, and also the deputy vice chancellor research, if they could do the honours. Professor Wayne.
For your information, in Singapore, when I got full professorship, I do not have this event. Then I I do not know how to do this. When I got a full professorship, I got email. They say, and you are going as full professor with effect from 1st of January. So, boom, that's all I get. Professor Xia and I are in first batch of Chinese people. In our time, we do not have graduation <laughs> <laughs> We never wear this one. Right. We do not have a graduation ceremony. Thank you very much. <laughs>